Hello YouTube's Captain Ab back here with you once again for part 2 of my uh, first impressions of the Leonardo Fly the Mad Dog X MD82. In part 1 we basically just set ourselves up for departure it took almost 45 minutes because it's a very manual airplane and uh, I love it for that. Uh, so here in part 2 we're basically going to start off at the before start checklist, do the start, the taxi, take off, climb out, and we'll uh, end uh, shortly after we level off and cruise and start prepping for the uh, arrival. As we go here in the later parts of the uh, climb out, uh, it, when it gets a little quieter I'll start showing off a little bit more of uh, how detailed the flight deck is, the exterior model, and tell you uh, you know all about uh, what's good and what's bad about the, uh, the uh, airplane overall. So without further ado, let's get right back to the before start checklist. Uh, enjoy! Sorry, but ATC sounds really loud to me, so I'm going to turn them down a little bit. Um, parking brake. So parking brake is uh, on. And uh, pneumatic okay, pressure, we've got uh, 42 PSI. Engine ignition selectors on yeah, both. Left and right tanks are all on. Uh, Anti-collision lights are on. Okay. Where'd he go here? Sorry, so many views sometimes. <laughs> there it is. Anti-collision's on. Um... APU normal economy switch yeah, okay, is normal. Right. Air conditioning supply switch is they're both off. Uh, pneumatic cross feed valves are open. The thrust levers are idle. The before start well, checklist is clear. November nine six seven zero. And uh, Sorry, who's that, I'll be honest. Uh, I should have GSX here. I'm not even sure if it's working. Good evening, Cherokee. Yeah, there we go. We got that GSX. Good evening, Cherokee. On the ground, that Wilmington Kilo and Yolingo Golf. We'd like to pick up GSX flight calling down the coast to Georgetown Golf Hotel. Handling by UPS and whatever. I'm fine with that. As long as somebody's here to push us back. He's spinning around into position. <laughs> wow, that's a dangerous tug driver there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see him do a do a, like a wheelie there? Right, uh, like a spin right in place. That's hilarious. Hello, Captain. We are ready for push. Um, what's your aircraft type? It'll be a PA two eight dash one four zero Piper Cherokee. All right. Just let me know when you get all those pins in and everything's good. We're gonna go back. And Locking gear. Thank you. Start at will. Send the whiskey one more time on here. Good to go here. Alright. Papa Alpha. We're moving off the gate, so starting engine two. So we open the start valve for engine two. Alright, down, down. You can see the pressure drop, you can see the start valve light come on. You should start to see some rotation of N2 there. We're looking for 20%. 20%, we can add the fuel. Anything above 10, we can add the fuel, but 20% is good for a, uh, a really nice, cool start. So there's 20%. Fuel's on. Pipe's rising. And one's rising. Oil pressure's rising. As we press 40%, we can turn off the starter. And just let it stabilize. There we go. She looks pretty stable. Normal start on number two. Let's start number one. Left start valve is open. And right, she's rising. November Oil pressure. Whiskey spot Oil pressure is rising a little bit. Oil pressure is rising. For 20%. And so for that, for that's probably 20. Alright, on. Back. Here comes ITT rise. N1's rising. Hang on, remember 9670 Whiskey. That's okay, perfect. Normal start. Start valve closed. At 4,000 feet and below that is. Echo. And there we go. So we Looks like we've got two good stable starts bottle, here uh, for on the MD-80. So yeah, I do know what I'm doing a little bit. <laughs> it's uh, there we go. In um, position, set parking brake. Parking brake is on. Things are slowly coming together here. Here he comes rolling well, slowly to do the disconnect. So while he's doing that, I'm going to turn the logo light on just for the fun of it. Maybe switch to the exterior view. You can just get a 
a little shot of this with the pushback. Uh, only now for the pushback. Sure like pins and everything. The engines are running. The lights uh, are on. And she's just a beautiful looking airplane. She's absolutely beautiful. And then it really captures the. Uh, thank you. Really captures the. Uh, you know the look of the American, the uh, polished steel. Polished steel. Sorry, steel. There goes my uh, crown guys. All right, looks like they're all clear pretty much here. So after start, we're gonna do a bunch of things here. I'm. This is where we're getting to stuff where I haven't practiced quite as much. Not quite as familiar. Right, it's clear. So I'm gonna go through this pretty much by following my checklist uh, that I've my little study guide that I've written up here. No answer from the attendant. No, okay. Uh, electrical system test. So uh, we make sure that everything is online. Uh, we are showing some load. And we do check that uh, if one of the generators drops offline, boom, the other one automatically takes it up. And actually what I should have is I should have the APU should be off first before I do this test. Uh, so the right generator took that whole load. Right generator goes off, left generator takes the whole load. Perfect. All right. And otherwise, uh, galley power can go on. Engine ignition selector can go off. Pedo static heats can now go on now that we have a good solid AC source. Uh, airfoil, engine, anti-ice, I don't think we're going to need right now, so we're going to leave those for now. Um, air conditioning supply switches, we can go ahead and get these back on. One at a time, because you see the little voltage spike as the air conditioner just starts up. There's a lot of uh, power being used, drawn for that. Uh, we can turn off the APU air now. Because we started the engines, we're good, we don't need those, and we can turn the APU master switch to off. It'll, it'll run for about 60 seconds and cycle itself off. Uh, just give itself like an a, a cool down time. Uh, hydraulic system, a quick uh, test and set here. So uh, if we put these both too low, you should see the pressure start to drop again. And then again, if I put this to on, you'll see that come up. Put the transfer to on, comes up again. And uh, basically, we leave those on for the uh, for the takeoff. And uh, the other thing we're also supposed to do is check the rudder manual. We should get the rudder manual light to come on there, just to make sure that that does work. If it does come on, perfect. Um, hydraulics there tested. ATC transponder. We're going to make sure that goes to on now. Uh, uh, Pneumatic cross feed valves. If we're not using the de-icing, then we don't need these because the bleeds feed okay. directly from their engine, so we can shut down the cross feed valves. Yeah, no problem. Just uh, windows. Sure. We're not cowboys. We're going to leave those windows closed, but they are really nice windows too. I'll show you the modeling later, but really nice windows. Uh, <laughs> door lock switch goes over to deny, and uh, door enunciations. Everything's off. Spoilers. We arm for the takeoff, and. Uh, should be able to arm this for the take for the takeoff reject as well and there we go so after start checklist engine ignition selector is uh, off and uh, pedo and static heaters are on airfoil and engine anti ice switches are all as required the air conditioning supply switches are auto door enunciator is checked and off hydraulic systems checked and said the after start checklist is complete hooray we're ready to taxi if you can believe it Philly uh, approach uh, American 782, ready for taxi. Took us a long enough, jeez. <laughs> Let's get that nose light on so I can see where we're going to go here. Uh, American 782, runway 9 left. Oh, now it's 3, uh, Juliet and Kilo 6. Okay, no problem, Juliet, Kilo 6 uh, for 9 left, American 782. Now, one thing you're supposed to do when you start out here, I found this out. And I'm making some reason. I'm not sure about your scenery. I might be uh, Kilo 5, Kilo 6. Okay, we'll take and a look. You see this. You're going to be Kilo 5. Okay, we'll take a look as we get there. I see it on the chart, so I uh, know roughly where to look for it. we got the uh, Sun Sky Jet scenery. Not sure if that'll have it or not. All right, Sun Sky should be uh, Kilo 6. Roger that. All right. So one thing you're supposed to do right when you just you start up is you're supposed to bring the, con the th uh, one of the power levers up a fair bit just as you start the taxi, and that's your test of all the takeoff warnings to make sure everything is correctly set for takeoff. So if you bring it up to 50% and you don't get any complaints or any alarms, then you set it up correctly. 
<laughs> it's a simple system and it works. So there we go. So it's going to be a fairly short taxi here. So I'm going to have to get the uh, taxiing check done on the go here uh, very quickly as we go. So I'm going to taxi kind of slowly just uh, while I try to find the line first of all. There it is. I see the line over there. So we right turn on Juliet and Dock with Fresno 9, nine left. And uh, being a little bit aggressive there with the uh, rudder. All right. Turkey, Should we have um, some brakes as we need to here? And, uh, 37 whiskey final way heading. got to be nice and gentle with it here, and we're just going to do the after start, so or the uh, taxiing checklist while we're going here. Because the taxiing checklist basically requires me to set everything. All right, after departure, right, so follow Juliet is here, is the inner lane here, and Maverick Hill is the outer lane, so we're going to go ahead and turn right here. Got to keep in mind that the nose wheel is fairly far forward on this airplane, and uh, the, the, the main gear is pretty far back there. So you tend to want to really go deep into the turns a little bit to uh, not cut the corner too much. It's a very long wheelbase on this aircraft for the size of aircraft. All right, so we're slowly moving along here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start setting everything up here. So flat flap lever. So down here, just on the engine controls, you'll see. Uh, when we first extend the slats, you'll see a little test. It'll run to the land position automatically, and then it'll go back to the takeoff position. And then we can go ahead and set flap 11 for takeoff, which should be the first notch of flaps in there. And we do see it running. Uh, exterior lights we've got as required. Windshield wipes we don't need. Park brake now. Okay, a lot of this stuff is sort of a little bit redundant. Do a quick flight control check just to make sure. And I do a little. And one thing you should see when you move the ailerons, you know they're working, as you did see, I don't know if you saw it up here, but the spoiler deployed light comes on just for a second there as I test the uh, ailerons. So I know that they're working. Uh, just test this taxi really slow while I finish this too here. Normally you'd have an FO to help you out. Takeoff data, we've reviewed. The bugs are all set. And uh, TRC and ART are all s are set as required. The aileron rudder and stabilizer trim are checked and zero zero. Uh, this is Victor, so the next taxiway should be Kilo 6, so really we're not going very far here. Uh, fuel heat as required. Fuel is pretty warm in the tanks. I think we're good for the takeoff anyways. Uh, FGS flight guidance system is all set uh, for 087, 5,000 feet, and a speed of V2 plus 10 of 152 initially. And uh, takeoff briefing has uh, already been completed. Cabin report obtained. Taxiing checklist complete. So taxi checklist. Good evening, Philadelphia, Cherokee, number 9600, uh, yeah, I almost don't want to. APU air switch is uh, off. Uh, TRC and ART are set. V-bugs are uh, set. I'm not going to read them off, but uh, I could read them off, I guess. Uh, V-bugs 137, 151, uh, 167, 187. Okay, VFR 3500, Cherokee, yeah, 167, right one. I think I had one more after that, didn't I? I have some 131, wasn't I? There we go. So I believe it's 138, 152. Oh, that should be 162, I guess. Uh, 168, 188. Should be 162. Slowest taxi ever. <laughs> <laughs> as I try to do all of this. Uh, flight instruments and flight guidance system are checked. The FMS is uh, checked. And uh, flap slat, we've got uh, extend and 11. Yeah, 11. Uh, auto brake is takeoff. Or sorry, auto brake is down, way down here, is takeoff and armed. The uh, speed brake is armed. The aileron rudder stab trim checked 0, 0. And uh, takeoff briefing is performed, cabin reports obtained. All right, taxiing checklist is complete. It's so much to do without an FO. I really, I, I'm looking forward to doing some group flights with some FOs, uh, just because it's so much work to get this done here. But all right, well, don't need a whole lot of thrust to get this aircraft moving here. It's really, really good scenery too for freeware scenery. This, uh, you wish every freeware scenery looked like this. All right, I know it's a little disorienting. I'm sorry, I'm not using the best. I'm using my hat switch. Track IR is on the list of things I'd love to get. Love to get it. Love to try it out. Unfortunately, you're going to have to put up with my scrolling around, watching where I'm going around the airport here a little bit. All right, but I'd say we're just about ready to go here. Uh, we do have a before takeoff checklist to do as well, so we just got to watch what we're doing here. But let's go ahead. And Philadelphia approach. Uh, American 782 ready for takeoff. Runway 9 or left. American 
Committee to uh, fly over and heading 1010 at 10. Runway 9 left, let's All right, fly runway heading and uh, clear for takeoff 9 left, uh, American 782. All right, so we're cleared to go. So let's go ahead and get some lights on as we get on the runway. So we'll go ahead and get the strobes on. We'll get the landing lights to go out and on. And uh, uh, there's not too much else on here, but there's a, there is a before there is a before takeoff checklist here that I have to go through, and I haven't even organized my thoughts very well here. Line up, ATC, TARA is on, fuel balance, check, brake temperatures, okay, take off announcement, and you can do that actually on the overhead panel. There is an announcement for this. Ladies and gentlemen, we're number one for takeoff. Flight attendants, please be seated. EGPWS terrain switch, the first officer has it over here in the corner and has to turn it on manually whenever we want to use it. Uh, not really sure why it has to be on manually radar. We don't need engine ignition selectors supposed to go to uh, both on the runway. Not a very good lineup at all because I'm doing a hundred other things at once and the EAOP is blank. Uh, before takeoff checklist, takeoff data is confirmed. The fuel is balanced still. Uh, brake temperatures are checked. Engine ignition selector is both. The EAOP is checked and the TCAS TARA. All right, we're ready to go. All right, I'm not going to talk very much for a minute while I just focus on what I'm doing here. I can bring up my PFD and my ND just for some guidance. All right. So bring it up to uh, what you look for initially is about 1.4 on the EPR. You want to see things stabilize around 1.4, and then you just simply knock the auto throttle on, and it just rolls it all the way up there. Takeoff thrust set. Clamp. 80 knots. Eject. V1. Rotate. Positive rate. Gear up. aggressively here to keep up with my gear up flight Lights director up. there okay that might have been a bit aggressive back down a little bit oh, it's too much speed here all right 400 feet we can go ahead and go heading and uh, let's go ahead and go autopilot on because I'm still <laughs> unfamiliar and I'm just letting this airplane fly. It's fly me around, but we're going to go ahead and go VS plus about 1200 just to let it accelerate. We're already above. Uh, uh, American 782 rear contact. American 782 climbing through 2200. Flap zero. And uh, American 782. Thank you. Um, Correct. Climb power. One two thousand. Climb one two thousand. American seven eight two. One two thousand is set. We're gonna go ahead and. Uh, American seven eight two. Once you pass uh, three thousand, turn left to that All right, uh, through three thousand. I believe that was left direct Pottstown for American seven eight two. Uh, that's for American seven eight two. Direct Pottstown now. Thank you, American seven eight two. We're through 3000, there's direct Pottstown, execute. We'll go ahead and get uh, nav on. I still can't even see where these switches are sometimes. There's L nav. Nav capture. And if we put this back on here, oops. There we are, we're in left turn towards Pottstown. I set the speed that uh, we're tracking. Uh, let's put uh, EPR is on climb now, so we've got the power back to climb power. We're climbing at 250 knots. Um, there we go, and we're turning on course. All right, let's quickly make sure we got everything else from the, uh, uh the one thing I've got to remember to do here is, uh, stow the flap selector after we're, uh, done using it. 
put it back to stow, otherwise apparently the, uh, the rumor is you buy the other person a beer if you forget to put that back in stow. And the art switch is back uh, to auto. Uh, Takeoff, FMS, engine ignition selector can also go to uh, back to off. Uh, fuel system as required. We don't have anything in the center tank, so nothing to burn there. Hydraulic system. Uh, so what we do then with the hydraulics do to do is we turn off. First of all, we okay. Let's do it from the FO side because I can't see because it's dark here. Remove the control column and you can see what you're doing. So we put these to low. Uh, once we got everything up, stays wear and tear on the pump. Nothing happens until we turn off the transfer and the uh, aux pump, and then you'll see these start to drop down to about 1,500 wheel size. Mm -hmm. Alright, thank you very much for the help. Uh, over to Unicom, American 782. Good night. Alright, and uh, brake temperatures, we just do again a quick check on the FO side that I'll check. Spoilers going into flight mode. So we just simply take it out of arm. And uh, that's it. We're through 10,000. We're also going to get the uh, lights off here. And we're going to go ahead and do the after takeoff checklist in a moment. I'm just going to get this climbing to 340. We're on course. We're climbing to 340 after takeoff checklist. And that one says uh, brake temperatures are green. Um. I just lost where I was in here. Landing, sorry, brake temperatures are checked. Landing gear is up, lights out. Auto brake is uh, back to off. And you hear that uh, stabilizer running all the time. Flap slat lever is up and retract. Speed brake lever is disarmed. Engine ignition selectors as required. If there's icing, we would turn it back on. There's no icing right now, so we're just leaving it off to save, thing, to save the uh, igniters. Center fuel pump as required. We don't need them at the end of the after takeoff checklist. And we're on our way bring up the navigation display. I keep clicking, right-clicking on it. Different aircraft, you get used to different things. Right-click on this, left-click on that. Uh, but we're on our way back to uh, Toronto here. And uh, there we go. Climbing through about 13,000. Uh, some spots down. We're through, through 10,000, so we can go ahead and uh, bring the nose down and let the airplane accelerate to, uh, let's, uh, oh heck, let's make it 300 knots. Just a nice, powerful airplane. Let's accelerate to 300 knots. Indicated as we climb here. And away we go. That is a lot of work to keep this airplane uh, up in the air, I tell you. But uh, it's very worth it, very satisfying when you get it done. But it is very much the older generation of airplanes still in a lot of ways. It's nice modern FMS. I do like this nice modern FMS, but it's uh, you're very much um, uh, you know operating the systems yourself. And one thing I find very unusual for myself, I have flown nothing but glass for 10, 15 years. This airspeed indicator is blowing my mind. I can't see it with the precision I'm, I'm so accustomed to nowadays. Just blowing my mind here. Go switch to some nice external shots, have a look at this baby as we're going. A little jumpy for a couple seconds here as it tries to figure out exactly what it's doing, but there you go. Beautiful. Leaving Philly behind us. I guess that's uh, Philly back down there still. Beautiful evening. Not too many clouds around it, so at least. And what a just a nice plane overall. Even uh, even here in the dark, it looks pretty good. Uh, zoom around. I'm going to leave the logo light on for this whole flight so you can just enjoy it. But it's a it's a very nice airplane. I didn't realize it was going to get dark this fast as I was doing this, but that setup took a long time. It, and it always it, it does anyways. There's a lot to do. If you have enough, if you're lucky enough to do a group flight with somebody, it'll be a lot easier. You'll find. Um, just to, just to divide the workload. All right, we're just coming up on transition, so we're going to go ahead and back these down to 2992. Uh, I should probably actually switch off to Unicom. Like I said, I was going to. This one's a little hard to see because it's really dark on this instrument here. Trying to fly that one at night would be a real royal pain in the butt. I don't think I can turn those in that instrument up anymore. One of these little dials here. So many dials, you don't even know. Ah, that's what did it. Aha, now I can see that instrument. Now I can see the standby cage. <laughs> only, this is only like my fifth flight in this airplane. I am still learning this airplane big time. I am not an expert at it by any means yet. Uh, but I, I'm just enjoying it so much. It's a, it's a fully functional airplane. The systems all work. They all seem to come together. You see the electrical spikes. You see the pressures shift from the air conditioning system to the... Uh, 
to the um, you know to the engine start valves and everything uh, you see that uh, the flat flap system with the dial of flap I would love to see some good performance calculators for this aircraft because there's a lot of good stuff here uh, but it's got it's got enough of the modern bells and whistles that you can still maintain sub situational awareness you've got the nice nav display here with the uh, moving map with your track on it and everything so it's not uh, you know it's not like we're flying exclusively steam gauges but I tell you this alone is just challenging for me honestly I have not flown steam gauges in so long but I'm like uh, I'm enjoying this. Like this is a really good airplane, really challenging in a lot of ways, um, especially to do it single pilot. But like I said, I'm enjoying it immensely. And this is this is not quite the price point of uh, PMDG, but uh, and, and FS Labs. But I'd say that it's pretty comparable. Uh, the only downfall to this model uh, or to this software that I found so far, really that I've had to deal with. There's a few quirks, there's a few bugs in it right now. Um, the FMS doesn't always work perfectly. Uh, I think there's a few glitches in there. Um, sometimes when you're trying to select departures and arrivals, it, it, it kind of freezes and will let you select things. So it's not perfect, but uh, it's overall pretty good. The biggest drawback is the manuals are a little bit uh, simplified, if you will. There are manuals that come with it. There is a fairly, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a small uh, manual either that comes with it. It's a fairly extensive, uh, operations manual that comes with it uh, with basic descriptions of all the um, uh, of all the different uh, what am I trying to say, all the different systems in the aircraft and uh, how to use them, little diagrams, uh, pictures of switches and stuff. Uh, it's not as detailed as an actual operations manual would be. Like the, the PMDG ones are essentially they took Boeing's manuals and they published them they wrote PMG across the top and they published them pretty much more or less as is these, somebody has taken the information from the manufacturer, but then kind of rewritten it and dumbed it down a little bit. And uh, probably it's for probably there's licensing issues and whatnot to go with that. And I can kind of accept that. It just it's it is a little bit of a drawback, but it's also less expensive than the PMDG software. So it's you know uh, I guess you get what you pay for. Certainly it I would say that it's good value for the money. I have no qualms about the money I spent on this. I, I think it's a great uh, a great airplane, a great investment. Just looking around at this flight deck. Uh, you know, it's it's fully functional. Everything moves, even like the little things, like the fact that the the wheel turns here as you as the pressurization system is slowly adjusting the outflow valve, open and close automatically. Uh, you know, things like that, like the windows. Like if you look at the window here, look at the 3D modeling. Like it's very hard to kind of do in the dark here, but the 3D modeling alone, just of the the knob and the and the whole mechanism here for this window is pretty fantastic. And if you can open it, I'm not going to open it now in flight. That would just be silly, but. You can open it, and uh, it, it looks really smooth and slick doing it. <laughs> it does. Uh, it looks really good. So, uh, just everything. The lighting is fantastic too. Like the the way you can adjust uh, the flood lighting and the whole like all the different flood lighting sections. I mean, it's very much a Boeing aircraft too. With uh, I know it's not a Boeing. It's a McDonnell Douglas, but it's very much. It's not. Uh, things are all sort of all over the place. Like the knobs for different lighting systems are in different places. Uh, scattered throughout the flight deck, I guess near what they light up. Uh, the one that was a little hard for me to find at first until I read the manual was the one for the flight guidance panel here, which is there's two knobs underneath the flight guidance panel. So they don't even look like the ones that are there. So it has that look of like it's a mishmash of different systems put together by different airlines. <laughs> or not different airlines, but different manufacturers. You know, like one manufacturer made the made the flight instruments, another manufacturer made the engine instruments, another manufacturer put together the, like everything's a little bit different. All the switches are a little bit different and like you look at the overhead panel and it's just a mishmash of switches of different sizes and shapes and colors. You know, and you compare that to an, a modern Airbus flight deck where everything, or, or an Embraer flight deck, and everything's 12 o'clock. <laughs> everything, all the switches are dark, and everything's pointed at 12 o'clock if everything's working correctly, and that's, you know, that's kind of the way it is. All right, one, I'm going to finally turn tune to Unicom, like I said I was going to do quite a while ago. But, uh, yeah, that's the sort of, um, that's the sort of level of detail that you're dealing with, and I, and, but I like it. it, it you know, it captures, I think it captures the spirit of it. It's a heck of a lot of airplane for one person to try and deal with here. It really is. Uh, you know, I'm I'm managing. It's quite slow, though, as you saw in that departure process. It took me a good amount of time, and I'm still learning the airplane, too. I'm still learning the flows. I'm getting very good at the pre-flight. The actual, the after start, uh, you know, the taxi takeoff flows, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting up to speed on them, but I, I really am not confident. I basically had my cheat sheet in front of me the whole time because I'm not confident yet in them. Uh, I'm sure I will be with a little bit more, a little bit more practice. 
but uh, overall, what a nice airplane. You know, it just uh, it, the way it's lit up here at night. I haven't even I haven't even seen the the uh, true glass really do anything yet either. I haven't uh, haven't flown on a rainy day. I should load up a rainy day in active sky just for the sake of seeing how true glass looks. Um, I, another thing I'll say about this airplane too: very friendly on the frame rates. Surprisingly friendly for such a complicated airplane. They they I, they must have done a lot of either, either. There's not much happening behind the scenes, which I don't believe really. So they must have spent quite a lot of time tweaking the performance. Now I don't have everything maxed out by any means. My computer's not great. I didn't max the settings. I want it to be usable. <laughs> I wanted this airplane to be totally usable. But uh, like, look around the flight deck. Like it really looks very good, and like you can zoom right in. And I don't have the highest textures, but uh, it looks really good. All the buttons, the switches, everything counting down. You know. Uh, there's my mock counting uh, counting down. I should probably actually transition here now. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, transition to mock. Let's climb at Mach 7.5. Hopefully that'll keep us at a decent climb right here. Until we get up to our cruise of 3.40. I don't know how long we're going to be there. I don't imagine we're going to be there very long. And let's start even looking here ahead at the arrival in Toronto because it's not a very long flight. It's an hour flight. The whole time getting up to 340 is not long, so uh, we're going to have to start really looking at the arrival pretty soon here. Uh, looks like uh, Toronto Arrival's online. Looks like I lost Toronto Center, but at least I got Toronto Arrival and Tower online, so we got some ATIS and stuff. ATIS going on there. Sending a quick note to make sure, see if they are going to be online when I get there. I would like to have some ATC. I do enjoy good ATC. Let's see, midnight 40. We're looking at about 40 minutes until we get to Toronto. Uh, but uh, yeah, looking pretty good here. Uh, overhead Toronto, 10,000. I think we need about 8,000 for our alternative London, so that's looking pretty good. Um, Yeah, things are coming along. Things are things are moving. But uh, yeah, what a nice uh, what a nice airplane overall. I haven't had any failures yet. Apparently, the failure I do have the failures turned on. Um, it's just set to go off randomly. Haven't had anything fail on me yet. I've only flown it like five flights, but apparently, I've been reading in the forums that people have had stuff failing after just a handful of flights. You know, it's it's just random. So I mean, at any given on any given flight, there's a one in. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I've read on the forums that some people have had the failures. Like, at basically any given point in time, any given flight, there's a one in a thousand chance of failure or whatever you set it to by default. And some people have just that randomly had that happen already. They've had things happen on the taxi out. And, and the funny thing is, like, at this point, because it's such a new aircraft, because it was just released a couple of weeks ago, sometimes stuff happens. I wonder if it's a if it's a failure. Or if there's a bug in the software, <laughs> I'm hoping it's more more the uh, uh, more the latter. Might dial this back just a little bit more, just just get us up there to our cruise altitude of 340, and then uh, that way we can get the power back and just watch the fuel burn. And the, the, the plan sounds good; it sounds like it's going to work. But uh, yeah, uh, overall, like a, like I said, like just a very nice uh, piece of equipment. Let's see if I can. Let's see weather radar is off. Let's see if I can turn this on here. If I go to, I don't know, we'll just do it this way. We'll just zoom in and see what we can do here. So if I push power, that should put it weather radar on, and I can probably control the tilt. Uh, well, that was the gain. There's the tilt. I don't know if it'll actually pick up ground clutter in a realistic way, but. Not too much coming in there yet. Not too much of anything. I don't think there's too much weather out there today anyway, so I don't think uh, it's going to pick up much. But it does. this does supposedly interact with Active Sky, so uh, if Active Sky is drawing convective weather out there, it is supposed to actually appear on the weather radar. I'm looking forward to doing that, dodging some thunderstorms in the summer. That should be fun. Lots of things I'm looking forward to trying with this airplane. I want to get comfortable with it, uh, you know, before I really try to do crazy stuff as it is. Like, it start to do the approach, and I start to feel like I'm just a little bit along for the ride sometimes when this airplane's on approach. It really... 
Uh, from everything I've read, it's a very clean airplane and a very slippery airplane. Uh, if you uh, need it to slow down, you need to get it dirty. You need to either get the flaps, at least the slots and flaps out, or use the speed brake. Otherwise, it's not gonna it's not gonna slow down for you. All right, we are almost up to our cruise altitude here. She's a bit heavy, I guess. Not the most efficient way to do it, but I really want to get it back there and just uh, get a little fuel check here. I got 13,000 kilo, uh, 13,000 pounds, and we're supposed to be overhead Toronto. With we're supposed to burn 3,000 more pounds to get to Toronto. Uh, top of descent, 179 miles. All right. I've had some prob problems with the VNAV calculations here. Uh, we're 330 climbing 340. I've had some issues with VNAV calculations that don't always look correct. No, this looks like it's correct. Wing 13, 610 will make CDAB at or above 11,000. No, that looks like it's correct. Okay, so we got about 170 miles or so to the top of drop. Just, I have had some glitches, but then I, I did read the forums. Again, the forums have been a, a huge resource on this. Uh, and from the actual uh, MD-80 captains, we don't really trust the VNAV in this airplane anyways. Fly it the old-fashioned way, use the, uh, <laughs> use the, use the, the uh, altitude to lose time 3 rule, because uh, the VNAV is not trustworthy. There we go. Uh, leveling off. So let's go ahead and get it up to uh, Mach 7.6 for cruise, altitude hold, nav track, so as soon as it starts to level off, it starts to pull the power back a little bit here. And we're going to go ahead and set cruise on the EPR, or on the uh, that thrust ratings there. And there we go, she's going to get a little bit of power, get up there, but then she's going to probably bring the power back. She's doing 7.2 now. We're just kind of still leveling, she's just sort of pulling it up the last 10 feet here, so as we sort of nose over a little bit here, to hold our altitude, that should pick up a little bit. Beautiful, and there we go. Made it to cruise, 34,000 feet, uh, already halfway to Phillipsburg. Uh, not very far till our top of drop, really, like just over 100 miles. We're going to have to start planning this uh, planning this arrival pretty much right now. So, uh, just a couple of nice little exterior shots, and beautiful, uh, I don't know if that's Milky, supposed to be the Milky Way in the distance? That could be the Milky Way, I guess. Absolutely beautiful, though. Uh, like when you do get up close to this model, though, the, the, the detail on the exterior model is absolutely phenomenal. And like I said, it's still good on the frame rates. Uh, I'm in cruise, so obviously I'm doing really well here. But uh, uh, I've lost my frame rate counter on this one. I, I usually have a frame rate counter up, and for some reason it's not working. But uh, you know, I, it looks like we're getting easily 100 frames per second right now possibly like easily over 60 and I've seen like easily 100 frames per second sometimes in like the non scenic areas like up in cruise like not close to the ground or anything but uh, even on the ground at the high density airports this thing easily get lets me keep a uh, well over 30 frames per second which is just great for such a detailed model you know PMDG I've only used the PMDG products in FSX and boy did it struggle sometimes to keep the frame rate up there so I will say like this is obviously more efficient but and the, one other nice thing I've noticed, uh, I did notice it the first couple times, but the interior is fully modeled from the outside. Each seat, each row of seats is modeled. It's not just a picture on the window. Each seat is there. And yet still, we're keeping up a fantastic frame rate. I haven't even looked in the flight deck to see if uh, they've got pilots sitting in the flight deck. They do have pilots sitting in the flight deck. There we go. <laughs> the airplane just looks lovely if you don't have a pilot in the flight deck. <laughs> All right, uh, so we're going to come up to top and drop pretty quick. I'm just going to switch over to my V pilot for a second and just pull up just uh, the uh, weather here in Toronto. Um, looks like a nice day, 5200 broken, ILS 5, 6 left, perfect. So that's what we kind of planned on, so that's what we're going to deal with. So uh, hopefully my uh, JEPs are not losing, my pilot's not losing its charge here on the JEPs too quickly here. Nope, looks looking okay. So uh, we're going to set ourselves up for the arrival in Toronto just because we're already getting there pretty quick. Again, in terms of numbers, pretty easy. Boom. Landing data. So takeoff data, click it once. Takeoff data, click it again. Landing data, it's all in here. Uh, and it shows you what it's going to bug for you. So uh, really makes it quite simple for you to sort of figure out what you're doing here. Um, and you can also pop this out and undock it and put it in the other window if you like, which is what I'm going to probably do for now so I can kind of have it near me while I'm sort of setting up the approach and I can make sure everything looks good. Now that you're in the air, click the airspeed indicator, the bugs come back to neutral, and then put it, click it again, and voila, it's now set to match your landing data. If I just put the landing data up here for you to look at, this is so easy to make a video out of because everything's here. Uh, our maneuvering speed, clean, 230. 
Our maneuvering speed with just the slats is uh, 180. 180, uh, yeah, 180. Our maneuvering speed, flat 15, 160, and then our uh, V-ref speed uh, uh, for flat 28, anyways, 143 is, is marked in there as well. So, <laughs> it, you know, super easy, and I can do the same thing on the FO side. Click his once and twice, and boom, all his things are set. I don't have any performance data for this aircraft, uh, so I don't know how to calculate the landing data. I might have performance data, but I don't think I do. Um, again, it might be buried in those manuals. I haven't looked through everything by any means. There's so much there uh, that I haven't looked through at all. So uh, it might be there. Let me see if I, I have the manuals copied over here somewhere. I don't think I have. Let's see here. Normal performance. Uh, procedures, performance. Well, let's have a quick look in this performance guide here, because I haven't really looked at this one yet. Uh, it, the manuals are not bad. I mean, I'm not trying to say the manuals are terrible. I just find the systems manual compared to... Uh, they're about the same level as Majestic. It's sort of a simplification. I, I just I think about the PMDG, and I'm just like, that is what I would really like to see, is, is that level of depth. That's what I'm looking for in, in a product. I know not everyone is, but that's me. I'm looking for that. I absolutely am. Uh, let's get some takeoff performance data. Okay, landing performance numbers. Uh, let's see here. Takeoff speeds, landing speeds, landing weights. Doesn't really give landing distances though. Got like 10,000 feet Toronto anyways, 8,000 feet. I'm more than happy that that's going to be enough, but it just, I'd like to, I'd like to make that calculation. It's the pilot of me that says, like, I want to verify that this is going to, in fact, work. I want to do the approach briefing properly, but, uh, anyway, so we got the speeds, distances, uh, flight plan. We'll just check it on here. The, uh, Ling 8 arrival today in Toronto. Uh, just pulling it up here myself. Where is it? That's Nuber. Ling 8 arrival for 5, 6 left. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so it is supposed to be Ling at 250, we'll put it at, uh, and we'll put it just a tiny bit, uh, low here. No, nope, won't let me do it. See, I've, I've had a few glitches trying to, trying to get stuff in. Okay, fine, you know what, that's okay. Oh, you know what, I think I'm on the directory page, aren't I? I'm not on the legs page. That's why. I don't know. I think it was on the directory page as well. So let me put it in. All right. So that was user error. There we go. 250, uh, 13,000 at Ling. Execute. I find I can't put the speed in if I don't have an altitude. So uh, there we go. Uh, 11,000 above at CDAB. And then uh, at Verco, we're supposed to be 220 knots. I mean, by then I could just be flying it manually. Uh, let's just be a little bit low. And execute that one. DARPU 210, 4500, 210, Danit 3000. That's all in there. Swing around for the uh, ILS. It's runway 6 left. And, uh, nope, not 05. 6 left, please. Alright, uh, so the low frequency 1091. So we'll go ahead and get that in on both sides. The inbound course 057. Again, we'll set it both sides. So both sides match. 100% here. 057. And uh, the MDA, uh, ILSDA is 735. So uh, we're just going to set the bug here. I can I can set the DA on the PFD, but I'm not going to set it because it's not really IMC. I don't really need the rat out that that badly. 7:30, that's fine. Uh, 7:30, 7:40 should be really. There we go. And does it match on the FO side what I'm doing? No, I don't think it does on, the, on that bug. So, not that anyone's looking from over here, but we can set it properly to be correct as well. And there we go. All right, uh, I think that's about everything I need set up, so uh, let's quickly do the uh, approach checklist here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So, uh, or the, uh, the approach briefing, I should say. So the distances are in, the speeds are checked. Uh, the Ling 8 arrival into Toronto. Uh, the routing is... Uh, Go back uh, the page here. There we go. Uh, so the routing of this starts at Wozi. It goes Istin Ling at 250 knots. Uh, 
Fedab between 13 and 11,000. Degro, then Verco at 220 knots. Uh, Darpu at 210 knots, at or below 4,500. And then Danip, uh, 210 knots at 3,000. Continue with Sire, and then it continues on a vector until we get turned over to the ILS runway 06 left. Low frequency 1091, set both sides. Excuse me, final approach course 057 is also set both sides. Here comes the turn at Phillipsburg. Uh, glide slope check height at uh, Vapna will be 2010. And uh, the ILSDA again, 736, so I got 740 set on both sides. Uh, touchdown zone at 535. MSA is all sectors around. Toronto, eh, highest east, 3100. Mr. Approach climb straight ahead to 1100 feet. Uh, and then a right turn uh, on a heading of 131 and intercept the 102 radial outbound to the two-dog intersection at 3100 and hold. Radar required, safe altitude of 100 miles is 4900. Uh, you, know, you know how it goes, uh, normal glide slow, bail SF2 lighting. It's going to be pretty dark, but we should see the runway nicely. Uh, RVR 2600 or a half mile, it's uh, 50 miles visibility, 5200 broken, so it's screaming VFR, we should be able to see it. Pretty easily. We'll land on six left. Vacate uh, left on the earliest uh, Canadian taxiway. Charlie one or Charlie three. Uh, both are rated for 35 knot turns. And then uh, taxi up to the gate. Uh, today I believe we're going to be going to Bravo. Somewhere up on the Bravo side. I think we're going to be Bravo 12 or 13 or something like that. And uh, that'll be it. Uh, operations. I didn't see any big NOTAMs that should affect our arrival. Uh, weather is, uh, as I said, v looking VMC, looking very nice. And uh, fuel situation, just give me one second here, actually, I was just uh, looking at the gates here. Yeah, we'll do uh, gate Bravo 13 maybe today, will be our uh, lucky number. And then, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, fuel situation. So right now we're estimating over Toronto with 10.1 kilos, 10,100 kilos in the tank. And I believe we said we needed about 8,000 to go to our alternate of, uh, of uh, London. Less than that, I think. Actually, we said we needed 6,000 something. Uh, yeah, like 64. So okay, so we're good. We're really good. Uh, where did we put that? I think we put it. It goes under in uh, performance, right? 6.4 is reserve. Yep, there it is. So we got lots of fuel coming over Toronto, uh, 4,000 kilos extra, 3,500 kilos extra, so we could definitely do a second approach if we have to go around for any reason. And that's about all I've really got on this. Still showing about 80, 90 miles till we'd hit the top of drop. Last couple of times, last uh, moment to have a look around this flight deck and just uh, really see what a masterpiece they've made here. And I do have uh, an overhead light somewhere here I can turn on. Uh, I even have a thunderstorm light, which is supposed to turn everything on to maximum brightness. It doesn't seem to do much, I'll be honest. But there we go. We do have a dome light uh, in the flight deck. Just turning it on just so you can see kind of the detail level, even behind us. Like, uh, this is definitely one of the more detailed flight decks, even behind the pilots. And sometimes this, you know, this area is often neglected because we spend all the time staring forward and that's staring at the instrument panel. But even behind the pilots, it's pretty detailed. We've got the safety equipment, like the, uh, the, uh, PBE and, uh, Oxygen uh, masks, everything. I don't know what that switch is for. I can't read the label on it, but uh, it still, uh, what a beautifully detailed model like this. This overhead panel is just fantastic, and it all it all works. Every switch works. Every switch seems to do something, anyways. So it's quite the uh, quite the masterpiece. I, I'm very happy with this purchase, and uh, I think they've done a fantastic job. I hope Leonardo continues to work on uh, on other projects not just this one. Uh, they have done a couple of updates already. They've been, that's one thing that I do like as well. They're very responsive at this point in time uh, to uh, everyone's concerns. Uh, people re report bugs, they, they, they file them away, They say, and they've already released I think two updates to date for this uh, software. So um, they are listening to the community out there. If the community's having problems, they are you know, they're relying on the community to help each other as well but they are they are uh, listening to problems and trying to fix bugs. So uh, they are supporting this aircraft quite well so far, as far as I can tell. And the funny thing is that there's uh, there are, there are already quite a lot of features to this uh, add-on features. Pretty much, I believe the same day this released, you could get the FS2 crew uh, for this. Uh, I haven't done it myself. I, I, I just I like flying by myself and I like flying with real people. I, I see the appeal of FS2 crew and I probably 
I see I see why people do it. I absolutely see why people get it, and I I'm not against getting it myself. Um, I I thought about it. It's just a question of you know what am I going to spend my money on? There's only so much money to go around, and and uh, I I thought about it though. I mean, and this is an airplane where FS2 crew would be very helpful with the amount of stuff you could get the first officer to do all those checks that you saw me do, and then you could focus on planning the flight, setting up the net, uh, the the guidance panel, uh, setting up the FMS, all that other stuff. Uh, you know, what else? Um, and then there's other libraries, too. So the, by default, this comes with about six libraries, I think, something like that. Uh, American, Delta, Alitalia, uh, SAS, and a couple other ones. Um, uh, there's also, like, a demonstrator, like a McDonnell Douglas paint scheme demonstrator that's there. Uh, so there's a, quite a few uh, libraries available, and then pretty much within, I think, about a week, somebody came up with a couple of different payware sets. One that caught my eye, and I, I, I chuckled, but even as I chuckled, I might end up buying it. Jets go. How long did they run for? Like two years before they went belly up, but uh, <laughs> with a whole fleet of, uh, of, of uh, MD-80s. So somebody's made the MD-80, uh, the, the Jets go paint scheme to put on this aircraft. And just, if nothing else, for sheer comic value, uh, to entertain the other control the controllers in the Vatsim network, I might well just uh, pick that up. I think it's it's not much. I think it's like seven euros or something. So it's not it's not free, but uh, it's not a whole lot. You get like two libraries in each each of the packs. So I think it's it's Jets going Alaska or something like that. So I'm not so much for the Alaska one, but uh, I might pick it up. For I might pick up the pack that has Jets going in it just for the just for the sheer historical comic value of that. <laughs> Uh, one thing I noticed, actually, uh, it's, it's a minor thing. They haven't really modeled the interior from the back. A little bit, but not really well. It's You're sort of sitting in the air, airplane clip, and I'm fine with that. Like, you, if you look out of the wingtip, it's still a nice view. There's so much other modeling that went on in this, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not one who's going to find too many too many faults right offhand. Bottom line, I think it was totally worth, worth the money spent. I think that what they're charging for this product is very reasonable. It's a very good product. Uh, they do have a QRH if you do start to run into abnormalities, and you will. Um, and they do have a full set of MELs, too. I guess uh, well, I've got a couple more minutes till we start down here. I'm going to quickly just show you the load manager a little bit here, uh, just for just for the fun of it, but uh, just to show you the product again. Uh, so the load manager here, it's, um, it's, a, it's a whole manager and setup page. So the load manager here lets you put in the information um, for your weight and balance, your passengers, whether they are in the front or the back, so it, uh, it determines the index, cargo, likewise, lets you determine the fuel, you can randomize the values, and then it shows you uh, your results, your index, and let me guess, Toronto Center wants me to contact him, yeah, 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 all right, uh, the index, um, uh, all that other stuff, I'll call, I'll call in just a minute, just to sh just want to show you this, um, and it shows you your ZFW and everything else. It shows you where it falls in the envelope. You can move stuff around, see how it moves. Uh, also included this is a fuel route planner. It's a, it's fairly basic, but it gives you nice performance numbers. If you're not using something like Simbri for something outside, you can put uh, your fuel plan in here. You can put air, airports in here. Give give it an altitude and a wind, and it'll come up with a crunch some fuel burns for you. The only thing is it's a little bit tedious to make a route that's fairly long. You can't use airways. You just have to use individual points. Uh, you can update this with Navigraph, but still only individual points, so it can be tedious to put stuff in here. So I tend to use Simbri still. But the nice thing is that then you can transfer fuel quantity directly to the load page. Nice. Failures and inops, you can set the failure rates. I have not disabled all the failures. I want stuff to fail on me eventually. I'm not quite ready for it yet. I'm a little nervous, but you can set uh, for light, serious, and dangerous failures how often they occur. And uh, as well, you can have deferred items. There's an MEL actually published, so that's kind of neat. Not something that's not done very often. And you can actually depart with the APU MEL, so you have to do air start carts, which you could do the air start with the ground guy there. And then there's a setup page to configure the aircraft how you like it. Uh, you can uh, choose different texture levels. You can turn off true glass, etc. Okay, I'm going to call Toronto Center. Yes, he's getting very nervous on me here. All right. Uh, so that'll be the end of part two of my first impressions of the Mad Dog. In part three, we're going to do the approach and landing in Toronto. I hope you're enjoying this video, and uh, I've certainly learned a lot about the Mad Dog in the last three weeks. I'm trying to pass along some of what I learned uh, to those of you that uh, are thinking about getting it. Uh, it's not an easy airplane, but it's certainly a lot of fun. If you uh, do have any questions about anything you've seen, please uh, put them in the comments below. I do my best to answer every single question that comes up to the best of my knowledge. And uh, while you're at it, please subscribe to the channel and uh, follow me on Twitch as well. I've got a Twitch channel now, twitch.tv slash captainnabs. 
And uh, I tend to post uh, slightly more casual videos uh, on Twitch, not so much uh, production values, but uh, just a lot of fun flying on Twitch, so please uh, follow me there. And uh, as always, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in part three.